Welcome to episode 93 of Lucretius Today. As a forward to this episode, we've now come to a major milestone in the history of the podcast. We have completely gone through the entire poem, and from here we'll be looking to take a new direction to assist in the study of Epicurus. I'm reminded that over the last year, we shortened the opening of the podcast so that regular listeners would not have to hear the same introduction over and over every episode. But now that we've finished the poem, This is a good opportunity to remind everyone where we started and where we're still going. Here's a slightly updated version of our original introduction. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who lived in the age of Julius Caesar and who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius' poem and discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. Be aware that none of us are professional philosophers, and everyone here is a self-taught Epicurean. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. Before we start with today's episode, let me remind you of our three ground rules. First, our aim is to bring you an accurate presentation of classical Epicurean philosophy as the ancient Epicureans understood it, which is not necessarily the same as you'll find that modern commentators interpret it as being. We're bringing you our own perspective on Epicurean philosophy unfiltered through traditional academic viewpoints, and we hope that our fresh perspective will encourage you to rethink the meaning of Epicurean philosophy for yourself. Second, we won't be talking about contemporary political issues in this podcast, and in fact we will stay as far away from them as possible. At the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we term this approach as not Neo-Epicurean, but Epicurean. We want everyone to understand that Epicurus had a unique philosophy of his own. Epicurus was not a Stoic, a Humanist, a Buddhist, a Taoist, an Atheist, or a Marxist. And it is very unfair to Epicurus and to ourselves to try to force Epicurus into one of those modern boxes. Epicurus was unique and in many ways a rebel against the mainstream Greek philosophy that most of us have inherited in one form or another today. Epicurus must be understood on his own terms and not through the lens of any conventional modern morality or political viewpoint. Third, Lucretius's poem is mainly concerned with the many details of the Epicurean view of the nature of the universe. But we'll always try to relate those details of physics to show how they were translated directly into conclusions about the best way to live. Lucretius will show that Epicurus was not obsessed with luxury, as many opponents have always alleged, but neither did he teach minimalism or asceticism, as many modern commentators allege. Epicurus taught that feeling, pleasure, and pain are the guides that nature gave us by which to live. And what that means is that Epicurus taught us that we are not intended to shape our lives based on ideas about supernatural gods, or about idealist abstractions, or about absolute notions of virtue of any kind. More than anything else, Epicurus taught that the universe is not run by supernatural gods, or by fate, and that there's no life after death. That means that any happiness we'll ever have must come in this life, which is why it is so important not to waste time in confusion. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive to you, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a thread for the discussion of each of our Lucretius Today episodes. Now, let's discuss where we are as we start our 93rd episode of the podcast. We've now completed our first full reading of the poem, so where do we go now? Here is the plan for the way forward. Think of yourself as just having been led through the forest of nature by Lucretius, our faithful Epicurean guide. Lucretius has led us through virtually every aspect of Epicurean philosophy, 
from the nature of pleasure as the guide of life to the formation and operation of the universe through the combinations of matter and void, to the issue of the inevitability of death and the end of life, to matters of how to determine what is true and how to think about life in the rest of the universe. Lucretius has led us in both the examination of the trees of the forest as well as of the forest itself, showing us how to go back and forth between the big picture and the details, and how they relate to each other to form both a forest and individual trees. Now that we've finished the poem, we've come to the edge of the forest. Ahead of us in a clearing, we see a number of camps of different philosophers, each with separate banners, but all carrying not only their own books, but also swords and shields which tell us that there's danger ahead that blocks our path forward. Our previous guide, Lucretius, tells us that it's time for him to step aside. In his place, he introduces us to someone new, Torquatus, the latest leader from an old Roman family of distinguished military background. Torquatus tells us that he too, like Lucretius, is a follower of Epicurus, and that he is now going to lead us forward through dangerous territory. Torquatus tells us that we must be prepared to encounter many philosophers who disagree with Epicurus's conclusions about the proper goal of life. And he tells us that a new method of exploration may be necessary as we encounter these opponents. He tells us, in fact, that in order to get past these enemies, it will be necessary for us to learn about weapons which Epicurus and Lucretius have already warned us against. Weapons which go by the name of dialectical logic and virtue. Paradoxically, Torquatus tells us that these weapons can bring great good to us when used properly, but that they can also destroy us if used improperly, and that therefore we must understand how they operate before we can use them ourselves without being destroyed. With that as background, over the next several weeks our guide will in fact be Torquatus, a character in Cicero's book De Finibus, whose full title means something to the effect of On Good and Evil Ends. This first episode you're about to hear is considerably longer than our past episodes, but in this introduction we'll lay the groundwork for those that follow as we examine the most contentious and yet the most important issues surrounding Epicurean ethics and how to live. Now let's join our panel with today's discussion. We've now finished the poem and we need to talk about where we go from here. And one of the big issues that developed, even in the ancient world, among the Epicureans at that time, was the relationship of virtue and pleasure and the Epicurean ethics. And since Cicero himself was familiar with Lucretius, and basically the poem has set the foundation for the physics and included some of the ethics, but I think this text stands as probably one of the most condensed debates about the ethics in which the actual Epicurean side is presented very well. So we can probably just talk in terms of this episode being we've we've finished the poem and the general outline of the physics and everything, but now we can turn to what developed as the real points of contention between the Epicureans and the Stoics and, and other philosophies in the ancient world even, and use this text as the basis for discussing that. Does that make sense? We are, we're all cogitating over the, uh, the the wondrousness of your words. That's what we're doing. Right, of course, of course. They're so brilliant. That's right. I, I, well, do, I, do, I do think it's interesting because right there at the beginning, he talks about that he's, he's not going to talk about the natural science. He's just going to talk about pleasure. So we've sort of covered all the natural science stuff in Lucretius, and now we're looking specifically at that pleasure of topic. Right. I think that is the point. We probably need to talk for a few minutes as well about what this is that we're reading from and what this whole book of own ends is about. And of course, there is some discussion of some of the physics in the part Mm -hmm. that we're not going to be discussing, but that's what they choose to focus on when they start talking about whether Cicero likes Epicurus or not and whether he respects him. Cicero includes some of his criticism of the physics, but then Torquatus here narrows it down and says, well, what we're really fighting about is the ethics. So that's what we're going to talk about. But let's talk for a minute about what we generally know about what this book is and Cicero and and so forth. Um, The big parts that stick out in my mind is just that this is the time period when or during the Roman Civil War, 
I think it's before Cassius and Brutus had been defeated at Philippi, but Cicero is in sort of a forced retirement and he's churning out books on philosophy as a way to spend his time is what I understand is going on here. We know from other material that Cicero had even attended some Epicurean lectures early in life and he was very familiar with Greek and with Greek philosophy in general. And the title of this book is Definibus Bonorum and Malorum. So Cicero was setting out to just do a survey of the existing systems and compare basically their ethics, their positions on what the ends of life are supposed to be. And another important point to add to that before somebody else jumps in here would be that everybody considers Cicero to be a Stoic, but this book is among the material that pretty clearly shows that he did not consider himself to be a Stoic. We're going to be reading from book one, mostly, of Definibus, but when you get further into book two and the rest of the, I think there are five books in Definibus, Cicero really tears into the Stoics, in my view, at least as much as he does against the Epicureans. Unfortunately, that's probably beyond the scope of what we'll have time to talk about. But Cicero considered himself to be sort of an heir to the Plato, Socrates line and, and even Aristotle. And he was considering that the Stoics were really, truly, as we criticize them often, playing word games with the word virtue and that they were obsessing over things that didn't mean anything. And they were basically undercutting themselves by being so focused on logic and carrying hair, it to an extreme. Hair splitters. Hair splitters, hair splitters, yes. So even though we're not going to be able to convey all that in our discussions in this podcast, everybody needs to realize that Cicero does not consider himself to be arguing from a stoic position, but from a more general Greek philosophy, platonic position. And of course, in our podcast, we're not going to include any of Cicero's arguments, at least to start with. We're trying to get people oriented to what the Epicurean arguments were. And so before we spend too much time on the criticisms of the Epicurean arguments, we need to focus on understanding first what the Epicurean position was. Well, hopefully we can do that in the future as well, because there are books such as Plato's Philebus and the Nicomachean Ethics from Aristotle that contain debates about these very same issues that Epicurus would have been familiar with. But again, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to do as well. Sounds like you have a 20 year plan there. Yeah, well, (laughs) as soon as we get our podcasters committed to the goal, then the panel will charge through all of those things. I have a feeling the panel needs a little bit of a break right now after finishing two years almost of Lucretius, but there's a lot to do and and so little time, Don, so little time. There you go. Anybody want to say something else about what they understand the background of this material to be? It is interesting, Cassie says, you mentioned that he's putting this together in sort of the context of the trauma of the uh, last civil war that ended the Roman Republic. There was a turn in Greek philosophy around the time that Alexander the Great sort of swept south across the Greek peninsula, and it was a change toward a more personally applicable understanding of philosophy. And this is where Epicureanism comes from. This is where Stoicism comes from. There's a deep connection between these philosophies and a kind of worldly trauma. So you got worldly trauma when Epicurus was starting this stuff. You've got worldly trauma here with Cicero. I'd probably make an argument we've got a little bit of worldly trauma with us right now. So We we sure do. Now, let's talk about that for just a minute. There's another word that usually, somebody correct me on this, some of these well-known philosophers consider this whole period to be some kind of an age of disillusionment or something like that. You focused on the word trauma, but I know I've read many of these guys will talk about this whole period as being a a decline from the prior confidence or aggressiveness of the earlier Greek period. I'm not frankly sure that I agree that that's exactly correct. But certainly that what you've just said, Joshua, is clearly one of the frameworks that a lot of people are going to read and understand as they read about this period. It's a period of social upheaval, might be another. Yes, uh, yes. There's no doubt about that. Absolutely. Right now, the, the Greeks had successfully fought off the Persians. And then they had this distinction between Hellenists and barbarians. And it turns out it was a Macedonian, which from a Greek point of view was a barbarian at the time, who just swept through their, you know, their society, their civilization, really. And so I would expect there to be some changes. 
Joshua, you're focusing on the trauma and the upheaval, and I completely agree with that part of it. Where it extends, I think, when you start reading into a lot of these general commentators about it, is that they extend that to the conclusion that because they were going through this upheaval, they turned inward. And they just abandoned their prior confidence in everything. And they were just trying to reconcile themselves to lesser standards in all sorts of things. And they were, like I said, abandoning their confidence in life and their confidence and their understanding of everything, basically. And that, to me, at least, is something I associate with these people who are into stoicism. They're just trying to find comfort from the pain of life. And they're just going to turn and live in their cave to the extent that they can, which is a perspective that I strongly disagree with there. But obviously, trauma is a part of life. And these guys were going through a traumatic period. And one of the things that I know I've read about Cicero is that he particularly was affected by, I think it was the death of his daughter or something like that. And I know the commentators that I've read will say that Cicero was really turning strongly against Epicurus the later in life that he got as these bad things were happening to him. So I think what you're saying is directly applicable to Cicero's commentary here. He's negative about any kind of a positive outlook on life. He's looking for discipline. He's looking for ways to extend that platonic no lie to the citizens of Rome so they can stand up for their civic duties and things like that. At least that's my perception of it. So he's writing this book for that purpose. And that kind of factors into it as well, into what we're going to read, because we really don't know where this material comes from. Supposedly, I think I've read that Cicero had texts from these various schools that he was largely quoting from, maybe, or paraphrasing in, in terms of writing the material. I think he may even say that somewhere, that he was paraphrasing other material. So in this Epicurean section, he presumably had in front of him some Epicurean texts that he was either paraphrasing or quoting or whatever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's presenting it in exactly the same way that an Epicurean would present it. And people debate a lot as to how accurate what he is writing here really was, which is something we have to keep in mind. Yeah, that's that's one of my... I, oh, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I agree on in principle on the spirit that you, you say about this one. So the civil war uh, was going on, but I need to make a correction. So uh, that Cicero was killed, murdered before the Battle of Philippi. That means the uh, power struggle was not yet finished at the uh-huh. time when uh, uh, Cicero was already killed. Because uh, in, in all this, there were also people-to-people rivalries. So Cicero and Antony were essentially rivals. No? And uh, then uh, Antony had Cicero killed. And later on, Antony lost towards uh, the uh, Octavian. So that means it, it, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, but yes. I agree that the, in, in this period when he was killed, I mean, that was essentially part of a complicated civil war. So it, it was it was just not uh, one side against another. It was also multiple people with different interests against each other. That's Don, a very good point. I found it interesting whenever uh, and whatever Martin just said, too, that the, the two people that he says were part of this conversation, I, I looked them up, too, and I found it interesting that Cicero actually argued against them in trials in the Senate. And so he had a history of, of arguing against these people that he's putting into their mouths in the work in question here. And I thought that was kind of interesting that they, they were on the opposing sides of, of different trials for, for both of these people that he uh, uses as characters. Yeah, that's a very important point for somebody who's not familiar with that background, that Lucius Torquatus, who's the main speaker here, the historians do agree that he was an Epicurean, but there's no reason to suspect that he ever wrote these words. He's, right. Cicero's using this as a device, almost like a platonic dialogue to go back and forth and just using characters that stand for particular things. I, I don't know who this Gaius Triarius, did you find anything about that name? Don? Uh, according, I don't think- according to according to one of the sources that I saw, it's a, it's a Gaius. Valerius Triarius. He also argued against Cicero twice in trials for against the same person. And these were trials for extortion and for electoral corruption. So him and Cicero actually butted heads at least twice in the Senate and, and on opposing sides of trials against the same person, basically. And he married a friend of Servilia, which was Cato's uh, half sister and the mother of Brutus. So he married a person who was in that circle of friends, at least, of Cato and Brutus and all those characters. But when interesting, in the book itself, he displays them as friends. Hmm? 
I get the impression that they were because I also saw that, especially with uh, Torquatus, that they Cicero and he were both part of the uh, the group that they called the Boney, the Good Men, and so these were the people that were standing up for those particular. Uh, traditional values and the importance of the Senate and all that sort of thing. So I think they did have good relations, it sounds like, with each other, especially with their views on, on the Republic and, and the Senate and all those sorts of things. But it just so happened that they were, you know, it, I get the impression it was almost like team members on two different sports teams that they'll fight each other on the field, but that they'll get off and then they'll go for a drink or have conversations or that kind of thing. It's very much a, uh, you know, we are part of the same group, basically. But, you know, whatever it comes down to it, you know, if we uh, have uh, if we're in a trial or something, it's even like two lawyers. You think of the legal profession that, you know, you can have lawyers that are that know each other and that will you know, argue against each other in court, but then, you know, go out and be friends outside of court and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. it sounds like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. In what we're reading, I don't gather that Triarius, Gaius Triarius, has very much to say, at least in this portion. Right. And now that I think about it, I'm not even sure that Triarius is, is considered to be an Epicurean. I think he's either in the dialogue as some kind of a neutral observer or he else, else right. eventually he sides with Cicero or something like that. Right. In, in all the material that we're going to read over the next several weeks on the podcast, it's all reputedly coming from Torquatus, who is a member of an old Roman family who talks about that yeah. some here in the text. What else should we talk about as a background? The main thing is this period they were writing in. And we, we mentioned briefly in the in the Lucretius material about the region of Kumai being around Naples and being a well-known place for the well-to-do to have villas outside of Rome and that this was a, sort of a, a normal sort of thing to do in that particular area. And I haven't spent nearly as much time with the full book as I would like to, but every time I do read through it, I come up with the conclusion that if I had to have a book on a desert island, I would probably prefer to have Diogenes Laertius first because he has all the Epicurean material in it. But this book by Cicero is a very good sweeping view of the competition between these schools. And there's a lot of really good material in it that helps focus on what the big issues are. And and that's what he's doing here. He's going to turn everybody's attention to what they think is the heart of the debate about what the goal of life is. And I think I've read that people say that back in terms of the relationship between Stoicism and Epicurus, Epicurus actually began teaching before Zeno did, but Zeno, who established the Stoics, then came along slightly later. What do you guys understand to be the historical relationship between those two schools? Epicurus came slightly first, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct, yeah. I don't have the dates for you off the top yeah. of my head. People generally talk about the Stoics as if, and because that's the school that people know about and they hear about modernly, and they they don't really even think about what sequence they might have come in, but. To some extent, the Stoic focus on virtue, I suppose, could be argued to be something of a reaction to Epicurus focusing on pleasure the way he did. I think the focus on pleasure goes all the way back, I mean, to Aristotle and the debate about it and Philippus. And so that's that that was a that's a big debate that had been raging for decades, if not a century or more. Right. And then the role of logic is apparently part of this, too. I'm not sure we really get into that in this material so much. But at any rate, this will help with the distinction between Epicureans and Stoics to go through this material. Cassius, there is a point that you're fond of making. One of Cicero's dearest friends, of course, was Atticus, who we know had affinity for the Epicurean school. And you've made the point previously that his portrayal of Epicurean philosophy is probably accurate because if it wasn't accurate, his friends would have come down on him for it. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, that's a point that people debate because there are sections here in this presentation by Cicero that some people allege is not representative of Epicurean philosophy. In fact, one of the reasons that it's good for us to take this text up is that you really don't hear this text discussed in Epicurean circles or in discussions of Epicurus as much as you'll hear. People will go to the letter to Menesius for the ethics, and they'll just basically highlight everything they want to talk about there in that letter, and then they'll move on to something else. This text is the real critical distinction and debate between the Epicurean position and the other positions. And there are very strong statements here about the nature and the role of pleasure, discussions about justice, 
and wisdom. And, and this is where we're really going to go into the issue of virtue. And people today don't normally look to these sections because it's not something they consider to be the most important thing about Epicurus. And when they do come to these sections, where I'm going with that is when they do come to these sections, they'll often say, well, this is really not a very good representation of Epicurean philosophy. And they'll say that, well, Cicero was arguing against it and misrepresenting it. So we really should not even credit what he's saying here as being accurate. And the point you raised, Joshua, was just that in the time that he lived in, Cicero had a lot of Epicurean friends, including Atticus, who, at least in my perception, my argument would be that even though he was arguing his case here and he would not have placed Epicurus in the best light that he could possibly place him in, he had some breaks on that because if he'd outrageously misrepresented Epicurus, there would have been a lot of people around him who would have criticized him for that. And I think his reputation for honesty and forthrightness and so forth, he would not have wanted to, to question that. In fact, I think in some of the material we're going to read here in the opening, he even says that he's priding himself on how accurately he's going to represent this material. Yeah, and I think that having uh, having that view in mind that Cicero is definitely out to make an argument, but that he also had to factually put out the, the Epicurean position is a good one to keep in mind, because I think what he does is, I mean, I'm slowly coming around to the idea that maybe this is, you know, a fairly factual point by point Epicurean position here in this in these sections that we'll read. But I think what he does then in his arguments against them in the next book is sort of set up straw men that he can knock down easily by just focusing on one individual little point here and there and not really taking the whole sweep of the the philosophy in, in mind. So I think that it's I think this this section here may very well be a good exposition, but then he just picks and chooses what he wants to argue against and then he can you know knock those down easier than he could uh, if he takes the whole sections and the whole concepts in and of themselves. Yes, I think that's exactly right. We probably won't have time in this series of podcasts to go into those in detail, but uh, I think that's a, a very fair description of what he does in the material after that which we'll read here. And some of those things might be a good jumping off for some discussions on the forum, and then we can sort of dig into those and get other people's thoughts on the individual arguments against this section. But I think having this as an exposition from literally the ancient times when there were original capital E Epicureans out there is an, an important source document. Yes, along with, I think it's Tusculan Disputations and then something about academic questions. But there's several works from Cicero that contain a lot of these arguments that are relevant to us today. And if we can find the time to go through them, they'll really assist in understanding what is behind these arguments and behind Epicurus's positions. So with that, I think, Joshua, you're going to read for us. We're going to begin in book one around what is listed as section five around line 13. And then we're going to skip over some of Cicero's argument against Epicurus so that we can focus on understanding Epicurus's position first. And so I think our plan for today in this first episode is to read what is approximately line 13 and 14 and then skip to lines 28 and read through line 31, which would take us up to but not include section 10. Uh, Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay. And of course, we should probably say that the text that we're going to be reading from is one by James Reed, published in about 1883. What you'll normally see on the Internet is a text by a man named Rackham, and that's a pretty good text, too. But as we got ready to prepare this podcast, we compared the Reed text and the Rackham text. And I think several of us came to the conclusion that there are aspects of the Reed version that are a little bit more literal than what Rackham has done. And it's certainly ideal to compare the two. But for purposes of reading on the podcast, we're going to read the 1883 James Reed edition. To begin with the easiest opinions, let the theory of Epicurus first enter the arena. It is, to most people, thoroughly familiar, and you will perceive that I have set it forth with an exactness which is not commonly surpassed even by the adherents of the school themselves. For my desire is to find truth, and not to confound, as it were, some opponent. Now, the tenets of Epicurus concerning pleasure were once carefully advocated by Lucius Torquatus, a gentleman trained in every department of learning, and I replied to him, while Gaius Triarius, a particularly serious and well-instructed youth, was present at the debate. 
Well, both of them, having come to me in my villa at Cumai to pay their respects, we had at first a little conversation about literary matters, in which both took the greatest interest. Then said Torquatus, I am quite of your opinion. Without adverse criticism, there can indeed be no debate, nor is proper debate compatible with passion or obstinacy. But if you do not object, I have a reply I should like to make to what you have said. Do you imagine, I answered, that I should have said what I did were I not anxious to hear from you? Do you prefer then that we should run over the whole system of Epicurus, or should confine the inquiry to the one subject of pleasure on which the whole dispute turns? Well, said I, that must be as you decide. This is what I will do then, said he. I will expound a single topic, and that the most important. Natural science I shall leave for another occasion when certainly I will demonstrate to you not only our philosopher's doctrine of the swerving of the atoms and of the sun's size, but will show that very many blunders of Democritus have been criticized and set right by Epicurus. At present, I shall speak concerning pleasure, though of course I have nothing new to say. Still, I am sure you will yourself yield to my arguments such as they are. You may be sure, said I, that I shall not be obstinate, and if you convince me of your propositions, I will freely give them my assent. I shall demonstrate them, he replied, if only you exhibit that impartiality which you promise. But I would rather deliver an uninterrupted speech than put or answer questions. As you please, said I. Then he began to speak. First, then, he said, I shall plead my case on the lines laid down by the founder of our school himself. I shall define the essence and features of the problem before us, not because I imagine you to be unacquainted with them, but with a view to the methodical progress of my speech. The problem before us, then, is what is the climax and standard of things good? And this, in the opinion of all philosophers, must needs be such that we are bound to test all things by it, but the standard itself by nothing. Epicurus places this standard in pleasure, which he lays down to be the supreme good, while pain is the supreme evil, and he founds his proof of this on the following considerations. Every creature, as soon as it is born, seeks after pleasure and delights therein as in its supreme good, while it recoils from pain as its supreme evil, and banishes that so far as it can from its own presence. And this it does while still uncorrupted, and while nature herself prompts unbiased and unaffected decisions. So he says we need no reasoning or debate to show why pleasure is matter for desire, pain for aversion. These facts, he thinks, are simply perceived, just as the fact that fire is hot, snow is white, and honey sweet. No one of which facts are we bound to support by elaborate arguments. It is enough merely to draw attention to the fact, and there is a difference between proof and formal argument on one hand, and a slight hint and direction of the attention on the other. The one process reveals to us mysteries and things under a veil, so to speak. The other enables us to pronounce upon patent and evident facts. Moreover, seeing that if you deprive a man of his senses, there is nothing left to him, it is inevitable that nature herself should be the arbiter of what is in accord with or opposed to nature. Now, what facts does she grasp or with what facts is her decision to seek or avoid any particular thing concerned, unless the facts of pleasure and pain? There are, however, some of our own school who want to state these principles with greater refinement and who say that it is not enough to leave the question of good or evil to the decision of sense but that thought and reasoning also enable us to understand both that pleasure in itself is matter for desire and that pain is in itself matter for aversion. So they say that there lies in our minds a kind of natural and inbred conception leading us to feel that the one thing is fit for us to seek, the other to reject. Others again with whom I agree Finding that many arguments are alleged by philosophers to prove that pleasure is not to be reckoned among things good, nor pain among things evil, 
judge that we ought not to be too confident about our case and think that we should leave proof and argue carefully and carry on the debate about pleasure and pain by using the most elaborate reasonings. Thank you for reading that for us, Joshua. There's a lot of important material, even in these few paragraphs that we've read so far. But let's deal with them in sequence and go back to the opening section first and see if anybody has any comments on lines 13 through 14. Well, I do think the first thing I'd bring attention to here is the use of the word arena. And uh, Don, I'm wondering if you have the Latin in front of you or anything, because I do notice, of course, when you think of arena in Cicero's age, you think of, you know, the Colosseum, you think of gladiatorial combat, you know, opposing one person against another and in more or less a fight to the death. So he's sort of setting the stage there in that very first line, enter the arena. I know I've seen that kind of comment, though, made by many of the commentators that that's what Cicero is doing is aligning these philosophies up just as if they were gladiators against each other. Which section is that in? It's in book one, line 13, five, it's section five. Yeah, I'm not seeing. I'm going to have to pick up a copy of the Loeb edition, too. I'm trying to find it on Perseus, but it doesn't seem like the sections line up on the Latin in Perseus than it does with the English. So that's... That will surprise no one at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but if we just Google it, I mean, then uh, it just refers to a kind of sand that was supposed to be used on the floor during ancient Roman battles to soak up spilled blood. So that yep. means it really has the connotation of fighting here. Yeah. A kind of sand, yeah. did you say? Okay. So that's a pretty visceral start to the uh, discussion here. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. We almost have to go line by line here because my eyes immediately caught next by the point that it is to most people thoroughly familiar. And that's another important aspect of this, of how well Epicurean philosophy had permeated Roman society by that point. It was not something that was peripheral like it is today, but it was one of the leading schools, it seems like. And that's yep. another argument for saying that he couldn't just make up Epicurean yes. philosophy whole cloth. So Yes, yes. In fact, he he complains somewhere, this is not the place, but he said something about Epicurean philosophy had taken Italy by storm or something like that. Yeah. Here's a question we didn't discuss when we were talking about the text as a whole. Maybe we should talk a bit about what we think Cicero's intended audience is here. Good point. Um, because I, I don't know a whole lot. I, I certainly know, you know, Rome had attained a somewhat impressive level of of literacy compared to what they were surrounded by probably but it seems unlikely to me that the people in you know the, the people in the streets were picking up cicero but i, I don't I, I genuinely don't know the answer to that question and i guess my question too is what did he even have an audience in mind or was he just basically doing this to you know i think cassius said to while away the hours in his villa well, doesn't he start out, I'm not sure if it's this book or several books, by just writing them in the sense of letters to his son. I, I know that the uh, own yeah. duties that, that is very famous was a letter to his son, and even this one may start out the same way. I don't have the, the text in front of me to confirm that. I'm gathering that Atticus and he had some kind of a structured system of scribes and were actually duplicating different writings for purposes of disseminating them among at least the literate Romans. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that he had in mind that this would eventually get out into wider circulation and he was attempting to create a literature in Latin. And it really does have the feel of a, of a platonic dialogue. So he's obviously aspiring to some sort of you know, philosophical tradition that's been around for centuries. And that seems to be part of their debate as well, that, that these Romans were had sort of an inferiority complex with the Greeks, that they were trying to duplicate the Greek philosophies and, right. and, and training in schools and so forth. So there was a little bit of intent to produce the same kind of material the Greeks had produced. Yeah, exactly. OK, so I'm not sure anything else catches my eye in 13 and 14. So what about line 28? Yeah, that's sort of where the rubber meets the road, I guess. That's so here's what we're going to talk about because he, he's yes. saying that you know pl pleasure is is the the point on which the whole dispute turns. So this this whole thing is going to be about pleasure. 
at least in this presentation, I, I think there is reference in the rest of this too. He, he criticizes Epicurus's use of logic, his methodology in, in certain places. And I think there's actually in the material we skipped some criticism of his physics as well. Mm-hmm. In fact, I guess that's where, I guess it's not until later down, but somewhere in here there's a reference to that he's going to skip over his defense of the swerve. And well, right. this is in 28. Yes, it is. In, right. What we have in 28, I demonstrate to you not only our philosopher's doctrine of the swerving of the atoms and of the sun size. So there clearly were issues even within atomism where Epicurus had deviated from Democritus and they were arguing about some of the physics. So surely there was at least as big an issue about the role of the gods with Epicurus as anything else, but at least for purposes of a book entitled On the Ends of Good and Evil, he's going to focus on ethics. Yeah, I, I get I get a kick out of uh, Cicero's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be obstinate. I'm, I'm going to be impartial. I'm going to be, I'm like, yeah, right, sure you are. <laughs> right, right. And let's not skip over the reference to he would rather deliver an uninterrupted speech than put or answer questions. That would appear to be a reference to the dialectical logic issue. Right, right. So he's basically so. So Torquatus is basically going to give a lecture, and then there will be a Q and A after it, in which uh, he and Cicero will engage in engage in debate in the arena. And I'm not equipped to go too far into this, but there's an, an essay that I refer to pretty regularly called the, um, the Epicurean Criticism of Socrates, and it, we ought to at least touch on the aspect of that, which involves the Epicurus had criticized the Socratic method of questioning and answering because to some extent the Epicureans took the position that you just need to say what it is you want to say. You don't need to play games with people. You don't need to go back and forth and hide the ball and claim that you don't know anything and and play games like that. You just need to put your cards on the table. And then once you once your cards are on the table, you can talk about what you're saying, but don't hide everything behind a bunch of opaque poetry and, and, even yeah and don't and don't argue for the sake of arguing I, I get the impression that in the socratic dialogues that so so many times socrates was just arguing for the sake of arguing and just yeah. trying to confuse people and i do find it interesting along those lines that i can't remember whether it's a fragment or a vatican saying that the person who loses a, a debate uh actually is the luckier one because he learns more than the other yeah. person. Mm-hmm. So there is a sense of, you know, the, there's a sense of, you know, we're, we don't know everything, you know, we are ignorant of things, you know, but to say that, you know, oh, I, I don't know anything, but I'm going to be a clever wordplay kind of guy and I'm going to twist your words and I'm going to make you look like an idiot. And then we, I, you know, but I, hey, right, hey, I don't know anything, you know. Yeah, Socrates was kind of a jerk. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Joshua or Martin, you have anything on that point? No, no not that just time. No. No, not particularly. Okay, well, we won't try to go further into it, but I would definitely suggest that anybody who finds that point interesting at all go read that article on the Epicurean criticism of Socrates, because they definitely were not holding the Socratic method up in the Epicurean school as the right approach. And so that's what he's saying here. He wants to state his position in a narrative form without a bunch of question and answer format as the best way to, you know, I would say that what he's doing is he's saying that it's, it's the issue of the forest and the trees. In, in order to understand how they fit together, you have to see the big picture and present the big picture first, and then you can fit all the details into the big picture as you come into contact with them, which is, again, what's in the letter to Herodotus about how important it is to have an outline of the philosophy, because you don't always right. need to know the details, but you do need to understand the big picture your points right so that's presumably what he's about to do is to then present the big picture points that we can then debate the fine points of later on but we produce the big picture first and the big picture at least or the issue that we're going to talk about is what he goes into in line 29 which is a very deep subject we need to spend some time on who wants to dig into the issue of what it is we're talking about what is the problem before us then? How do we define the problem before us then? I think he does a good job of laying out the the problem right there. So what is the climax and standard of things good? And then by, he defines it as all philosophers must needs be such that we are bound to test all things by it, but the standard itself by nothing. And Epicurus says that standard is pleasure. Everything is Everything is judged on whether it brings pleasure or not. 
and pleasure itself is self self evident and doesn't need correct. To be, yeah, it doesn't need to be tested by anything else really. Yeah, yeah. What you've just raised there, Joshua, I would call attention to. He hasn't said that the question is what is the standard of things true. He has right. said what is the right. standard of things good. And so there's a difference, presumably, between what is good and what is true. Now, you'd presume that the good is true, but true is a wider concept even than good. How how can we elaborate on that? Good means what's desirable and the things you should pursue or something like that, right? What is is bonorum? (laughs) Yes. And malorum. Yes. Exactly. This might be a good time to talk about the Latin phrase summum bonum. Yes. Yes. yeah, that this is a perennially thorny problem, but uh, of course the Greek use of the word telos, mm-hmm. telos was the end and pleasure was the end, and then in Latin it becomes summum bonum, high is good. This issue seems to come up again and again. I'm wondering if anybody has anything to say about it. In well, that that's that's my, I mean, that's where I get I the the you know the it's the climax and standard of things good, the the telos, the end, the goal. The, the climax, the standard, it's it's all the same. It's all synonyms for the same thing. It's that that which is, you know, the end towards you work. And and Epicure says that 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 highest good, that climax, that standard, that goal, that telos is, is pleasure. Well, the problem I, c- I continually see, and we see this all the time on the EpicureanFriends.com forum, is, w- is when you use the phrase highest good. Right. You're inviting the presumption that there are other things which are good in themselves besides the highest good. Whereas- and, and I yeah, and I think that's exactly the point that I, I think I've like tried to be on that soapbox time and again on, on the forum, too, that is that highest does not mean the best among um, different things, you know, virtue and wisdom and all those sorts of things. It doesn't mean that the pleasure is the best thing. It means that that's the thing towards which everything points. And so that you are. The, re- the reason that you the reason that you exercise virtue is to gain pleasure. The reason that you make wise decisions is to gain pleasure. So everything in the end points towards pleasure. And I think the use of the word highest really is almost a I mean, I mean, Epicurus uses uses that word. Melistos, I believe, is the, the word in Greek. You know, the, but um, but I think that uh, the idea of the the idea of the uh, the climax or, or you know that it's at the summit that it's at the top points towards so, the fact that it's not um, that it's um, you know it's not it's, it's not it's, the it's, best among rivals but it, yeah to, f- feel free to pick up on that <laughs> yeah but it yeah, but it is the best among rivals isn't it well 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 yeah. it's the way Joshua? I would put this is it's not the first among equals right it's, there it's, you go it's it's a difference. Not in degree, it's a difference in kind, right? Okay. The, the highest well, good, is it? it I, that, I, I would say that's an interesting assertion, but I'm, I'm not sure that's ex- – do we know that for a fact? I mean, that's not even a good way to ask the question. I don't – Well, what I, mean, what I mean by difference in kind is, is pleasure is good in itself, and all other right. things are that are, we would say, good, you know, in, in the common use of that word are good by reference to in that they're inst- ins- that they're, they're, right. the word that I keep coming back to is instrumental goods, that they're instrumental goods in Very. service to the highest, quote unquote, the high, quote unquote, highest good. Well, one of the questions I hear you guys talking about is the question of, is there more than one good? Yeah. Oh, there, there are a multitude of goods, but the only one that you can use as a standard, according to Epicurus and Epicurean philosophy, is pleasure. And he does say that here. What is the climax and standard of things good? I mean, the, right. the framing of the question right. assumes that there are other things are. that are good. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, one of the reasons I think we picked the read translation here is because he does use a little bit of different wording than we commonly see. Because mm-hmm. because right here is where some people are going to say the question is, what is the highest good? But what Reed says that Cicero was saying is what is the climax and standard of things good? And I definitely see in my own mind a difference in meaning between the word highest versus Mm -hmm. standard. Now, climax is pretty close to highest, but standard to me is a is a different term. So that's the canon right there. 
So it's a it's it's the the standard the standard is the cannon the 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 the, the measuring stick the yardstick the right right the, the plumb line the all that sort of it's, thing that you you judge surveying. everything else by. In, in surveying, survey, yeah, there you go. <laughs> in surveying, we use the term benchmark as a as a reference right. point for elevation. So exactly. So pleasure so is the pleasure benchmark. and Lucretius. In fact, if you read, I, certainly I know in the uh, Rolf Humphreys translation, he does refer to it as the benchmark or the uh, boundary stone set forever. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's and it's a, and that's and that boundary point by which everything else is judged. Yeah, and that boundary point I think is 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 um sort of conveyed by the whole idea of the latin word finibus it's 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 the final thing it's the end thing it's what you come to at the end of the trail or i'm so glad you brought that up don yes absolutely yeah well let's stay with this issue of when it says this is the climax and standard of things good that word good and i think what you have to do is why is something good so why is some the question that you have to ask as the the standard is you know why is something good and Epicurus says it's good if it brings pleasure and Don that the question why is something good applies to all goods except for the highest good which is pleasure exactly it, it doesn't make sense to ask why pleasure is good pleasure is just self evidently good yep. And it gets into that too farther down as well because Epicurus says a, that exact thing. He says pleasure is good. You know, of course pleasure is good because it feels good because you you know when you feel pleasure you know that you know all I have to do is like you know point to it and it's like, it's like are you are you feeling pleasure now and you say yeah it's like mm, well there you go that's that's basically it seems to me Epicurus's position whereas it almost seems to me in the later sections here that we just read or that I should say that Joshua just read that the later Epicureans almost got bullied into trying to use logic and rhetoric and and fancy arguments as to why pleasure was good. And the original founder of the school was like, you don't need to do that. It's it's self-evident. Whenever you feel pleasure, you know you're feeling pleasure. Okay, there's so much here. Before, <laughs> and, and before you, 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 the last thing you said there, Don, takes us down to towards the end of this presentation for today. But I still want to say before we get to that part of it with this issue of what good means. And now, even in this text here, the in line 29, it says Epicurus places this standard in pleasure, which he lays down to be the supreme good. Now, when we use that phrasing, the supreme good, does that mean there is more than one good? Oh, yeah. It means there, there's more than one good, but okay. the pleasure what are is other the, What are other goods besides pleasure? Oh, I think that Epicurus um, lays it out whenever he talks about you cannot live pleasurably without living wisely and honorably and justly. So justice – honor and and wisdom are all goods but they are instrumental goods to the supreme good which is pleasure it's basically pleasures pleasures the king and everything and everything every other good serves the king joshua do you agree that wisdom is a good well don does bring up the use of the word instrumental good yes he's he's qualifying it yeah exactly but here's my issue and i kind of I, i just i so thoroughly prefer the word telos because yeah. the summum bonum and yeah, I know I know it's I know it's a Lucretian phrase. I know it's it's certainly in here. Um, it's it's such a snake's nest of of problems. And <laughs> oh, we, good, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Snakes and, in the arena. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And with 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 Telos, it just couldn't. It's just, something just it's like the air just clears it, you know, uh, when you use, you start using the word Telos instead of sumum bonum, sumum bonum, it just doesn't invite the same kind of problems right what's a better what's a better english word than for telos end or goal yeah, yeah. Goal. martin do you agree that wisdom is a good yes mm-hmm. any way to elaborate do you need to use the word instrumental good to qualify what type of good it is i mean some people would argue that a good is something that we want in and of itself don do you disagree well, they, with well the there's word good? well there, yeah, yeah well there's the uh, there's there's the rub i mean i think that's what the whole whole argument or discussion or you know, whatever you want to call it, combat in the arena, is that you have people who feel that virtue in and of itself, like the Stoics, is you know a good 
in and of itself. You have people like Aristotle who feel that, you know, the wisdom or you know philosophy is a good in and of itself, that you, that's what you should direct your life towards. And what Epicurus is saying is that there, there, there is the pleasure is the good towards which your, your life should be directed. So I think that there, I think there are any number of good things, let's, let's say good things, but Epicurus's position is that all those other good things are good because they bring pleasure. And that's, that's why pleasure is the standard. You, you judge every other good thing by whether it brings pleasure or not. And if it doesn't bring pleasure, then you, in his words, you know, spit on it. So you do not restrict, Don, then the use of the word good to something that is desirable in and of itself. I think that by your definition there, I think only pleasure is good in and of itself. The other things are good because they bring what is good in and of itself, which is pleasure. Joshua, do you agree with that? I'm not suggesting you should or should not. I, 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 this, <laughs> yeah. this is a hugely complicated question. So let's. Cassius, yeah. do you agree with that? <laughs> I believe. I, well, let, me, let me go ahead and preliminarily state what, what I think as of uh, the time we're recording this, which may change by the time we end the podcast. Yeah, but what, what's, your, I, what's, your, what's your statement always that I, I reserve the right to, to revise? Extend and, and revise. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think what we're wrestling with here is this sort of definitional issue. And I'm not so sure myself that Epicurus would himself have agreed with this paragraph nine or line 29. Oh, I think Epicurus says exactly this in in his extant writings. And I'll be happy to dig him up, but I think he says exactly this thing. Well, what what I'm referring to there when I said I'm not sure Epicurus would agree with it is I'm not sure he would agree with this formulation that what we should be doing is to do you have a, a site for the the opinion of all philosophers must needs be that such we are bound to test all things by it by this but the standard itself by nothing i guess what what i'm trying to say or articulate is that there's a there's a huge definitional issue here to me about what good means and in the end, I'm thinking that Epicurus is going to be saying, as, as explained in this next paragraph, that in the end, you don't worry about the definition as much as you look to what nature is telling you to do through the senses. And he's saying that the he's saying that his proof of his conclusion does not come through logical reasoning, but comes from observing what the young of all living things do. And that it's that observational method of saying that the only thing that nature has given us is the senses to determine what to do and what not to do. And the senses are telling us that some things are pleasurable and some things are painful. And I think he is, in a sense, rejecting a definitional approach to what is the good. But I, like I said, I could change my mind about that and because and, and I'm, I'm, I'm now collapsing everything else in what we've read today, because I think that's what's the issue that's discussed in this line 31, where Cicero starts talking about some in our school think that it's not sufficient to just look at what babies right. do and they should go further and we should have an elaborate, logical argument about it. And so although I, I don't have a final articulation of the way I would express that myself. I, I think that's part of what we're wrestling with here. Because one of the things that causes me the most problem of all this that we're talking about with the highest good is that there's an implication that there's only one highest good. There is. <laughs> and you're defining it as the word pleasure. But, I'm defining but the, it as a feeling of pleasure. You're defining it as the feeling of pleasure, but the feeling of pleasure does not it express itself to us in many different ways. Oh, I, don't, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can find pleasure in any number of things, but it's still it's still pleasure. I mean, that's that's the point, I think, that the relationship between the feeling and the word is what I'm trying to scrutinize here. Because well, I, think that, well, I think that goes back to Epicurus's. Uh, contention that you have to use what is the commonly accepted whenever somebody says pleasure i mean i think i think epicurus's thing is that you know, everybody knows what pleasure is everybody knows what pleasure feels like and that to try and you know twist it into something else or try to i mean that's that seems to be the i can't remember which book of on nature it is that sedley wrote the paper on but that that's that's the whole sort of crux of that and that that was his argument against socrates too socrates tried to like give other definitions of war of 
other definitions to words that weren't commonly accepted and to twist words around and epicures, you know, what, what does it mean? What, whenever you say the word, what does, what does, what does it mean? And I think that whole idea here of the, uh, the three different positions is kind of interesting because you have, you have Epicurus himself saying, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to point to it and we don't need any proof or formal arguments. Then you have the, the second ones that are wanting to a little bit more, you know, logical arguments and they need to have uh, more, uh, more, more disputation or whatever it is with that one. And then the final, I find it interesting that Turquatus, the character of Turquatus then, is saying that you know well I agree with the third position. Yes. I, so I think that so there are three you know very different approaches to how you define pleasure or the goal or the standard or, or whatever you want to say, and that there are like like I said my feeling is that they the later Epicureans seem to have been almost bullied into trying to come up with a, a more you know, logical, flowery, rhetorical argument for their position, whereas Epicurus was like, I'm just going to point to the kids and the animals and, you know, they go towards pleasure and they avoid pain. And that's what what nature is telling us is the is the highest good. Before we maybe go into that paragraph, which is 31, we really haven't spent time focusing on line 30, which is the statement of Epicurus's position. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about line 30 before we go into the dispute that Cicero starts talking about, because we've been referring to it, but Epicurus specifically says, according to this, that and he finds his proof of this on the following considerations. Every creature, as soon as it is born, seeks after pleasure and delights therein as in its supreme good, while it recoils from pain as supreme evil. And this it does while it is still uncorrupted, and while nature herself prompts unbiased and unaffected decisions so he says no reasoning or debate to show why pleasure is a matter for desire and pain for aversion right and that these facts are simply perceived just like fire is hot snow is white and honey sweet okay so so he's affirmatively saying that you just simply point to it and observe it it's enough merely to draw attention to the fact but then what's this part that follows that, Don and Joshua and Martin? He, he, he then says there's a difference between proof and formal argument on the one hand and direction of attention on the other. Well, I think he says there in the, in the later part of that section that he talks about proof and formal argument will give you things that you can't actually see. And I think that goes back to your endorsement or or, or encouragement of people to read the uh, the, the Philodemus uh, methods yes, of yes. inference. Yes, that one. So I think that's that's where the proof and formal argument comes in. And then the slight hint or direction is what he's talking about with pleasure and pointing towards animals and babies. So there are some things that you can just say, you know, it's self-evident, like pleasure is good, whereas the swerve of the atoms and that sort of thing need the, the proof and formal argument through those methods of inference. I have a tangential line of questioning here. I'd like to pitch to Martin um, and just see where it goes. Martin, you are no doubt familiar with uh, Bertrand Russell and his uh, Principia Math Mathematica, I think it was called. Uh, again, what was it about uh, Russell? Uh, Bertrand Russell and his Principia Mathematica, in, in which the project of that work was to sort of scrap mathematics and start again from the foundation, proving everything as you go along. So he starts this off, and this is totally beyond my understanding, but he starts it off by trying to formally prove that one plus one equals two. I'm not familiar with that of him, but I know that this type of pro pro project uh, existed, and I hope I don't, I, I'm not mixing up these, these Russells. So, 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 so uh, there was one Russell who exposed a problem with original set theory, and uh, that, that that really caused a problem with uh, the, the mathematical logic. And only by yeah, redefining what sets are actually are, so how, how to to narrow down uh, what a set can be, they could save set theory because uh, this, with this set theory there was a very elegant way of uh, building mathematics uh, from the start with logic. And uh, that one is, has been carried out, uh, I think not so much by Russell himself, but th th there was a, a, a group of French mathemati mathematicians which gave themselves one code name, and under this one they worked it out in every detail. And pretty much along that program, uh, mathematics has been taught at universities for decades already. Yeah, you do have that right. He was involved in set theory as well. And it, it comes back to this idea 
how do we know what we really think that we know? And for Russell and for the uh, mathematicians who had sort of bumped up against this problem, and part of the problem was you had people like you had in the ancient world, the, the skeptics, you had people who were saying that, n that no knowledge is really possible. We can't really know anything. And so he began by proving what had hitherto been just been accepted based on, you know, if you want to know that one plus one is two, I've got, you know, two cups of coffee sitting next to me in the car, one from yesterday, one from today. I got one, I got one, together you have two. That's enough for me. It wasn't enough for Bertrand Russell and the advanced mathematicians who were uh. trying to reestablish first things. I think that bears upon this question. It does. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, no, really. The thing is, the consequence of, of, of building mathematics like this is that it was completely removed from reality. Right. So mathematics stands its own independent of reality. And it's rather by chance from this viewpoint that mathematics provides excellent tools to uh, describe reality, but there is no uh, uh, fundamental reason why this should be the case. So this is just an, uh, an empirical thing that mathematics works in reality. No? But the, the way mathematics is not built, it's completely a construct of the mind, and in itself, it doesn't bear with reality. Oh, Joshua, yeah, Joshua, what I hear you saying, for example, when you talk about the coffee situation, you have one cup of coffee and you have another cup of coffee. Do you really have two? What does two mean? Does two exist in reality or is two just a word that in our minds we've decided to assign to what we observe as there being two cups of coffee? Is that part of where you're going? How yeah, does it you know you have one thing and you know you have another thing, but how do you establish in a pure, perfect mathematical way that together these things make two things. Yeah. Uh, well, well, what is yeah. what is two? I mean, just because you say that we have two of these things in front of us, it's not like there's nature sitting out there somewhere that says, yes, you're right, Joshua. There are two here. <laughs> or God is not out there saying, yes, you're right, Joshua. You've reached that stage of understanding where you understand what reason is and you've connected to this flow of natural law out there that you have identified and discovered the, the concept of two exists. Way to go, Joshua. I mean, there's no God or nature doing that. And to some extent, I'm not even sure that when I try to work myself up, does two really exist? Does two have a separate existence other than what humans give to it? That's what I hear Martin saying, too, is mathematics allows us to sort of predict and recreate and work with reality. But there's no reality to mathematics in a sense, right? Yeah, but or wrong? For someone who knows mathematics, and who, who knows how to live in reality. Né? So there is, it's really a one-to-one -one thing. So it's very clear to him, ah, so what we call in, in, in mathematics uh, two, as for example, added by one plus one, this one matches what we see in reality if we put two cups of coffee together. Well, it matches what we see in our minds that we choose to assign to that. But as far as, again, the, what, your, what your standard is, your ultimate standard, your ultimate standard is is your perception of it. Not that by perceiving it, you you create what exists or not. Whether there are two cups of coffee exists, whether you perceive it or not. But the choice to consider that to be two cups of coffee instead of just simply objects floating in space is within your mind, right? Well, you, you would also you could also say that you have a pair of of a a pair of cups so you don't necessarily have two you have a pair which is actually a unit in and of itself mm -hmm. a pair yeah, yeah but, but you can uh, you can uh, put up an experimented uh, prescription which, which pretty much shows this addition so that means uh, you, you have a standard size cup no? and you have something like a measuring device no? then so then you pour one cup into that measuring device which maybe is then divided into cups and then you see that uh, if you add one cup after the other, it all adds up nicely. So it matches uh, the scales identified there. So in this way, you can make a one-to-one -one, uh, matching between what's in the mathematics and what you see in reality. So that uh, the filling of this vessel with, uh, with the scale, no? ah, now we have five cups in there, the, the level stands at five. So, so you really uh, uh, match it. So, so that means it's something what you can really demonstrate uh, experimentally. 
Well, here, here's a question for you then. So I have one cup of coffee and I have a second cup of coffee. If I pour them into a bigger cup and they're both in the same cup, do I have two cups of coffee now or do I have one cup of coffee? It depends how you define the term, term cup too. Yes, exactly. So that's why I had uh, why I had to go to a standard size of cup. No? So where 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 uh, if you take another cup and uh, uh, pour it into that one, it will flow over. So that means yeah. uh, that that method uh, uh, won't work. So so that means then you need to call it differently. So instead of pouring it from one cup into the other, you have this measuring device, and then you pour one cup in there and another cup. Then you have uh, there are now two cups of uh, coffee in that measuring uh, vessel, no? and you can then also play around with. Oh, now I don't fill my cup completely, and I do this with all the same way. And, and then uh, you 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 pour them into this measurement vessel, and then you can can, can count from there and and see from there what fraction of uh, one cup you filled it uh, up to before. So so you can really uh, again, expand on this one, how the mathematicians expand from these natural numbers to fractional numbers, and you can see how this works in reality as well. So the cup is the standard. Yes. Okay. We're going to have to start thinking in terms of a standard. We're going to have to start thinking about a standard length of our podcast, and we're going to have to figure <laughs> out a way to extricate ourselves from the deep dilemma that we are currently in, because this issue we're now I, discussing I, I is I so incredible. Go ahead. I, I don't have a dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> well, you in particular have a dilemma, Don, because I, I was thinking of you exactly when you said that, because I'm going to relate this to, again, we've got to find a way one of these days to go through the Philebus book as well, because I, I sense that we are in the middle of this very preliminary step of the platonic dialogue of Philebus, because I think what we're talking about here is this issue of the one and the many, which I find so difficult to wrestle with and even to understand. But I believe that that's what we're going to find when we finally get to that, that early in Philebus, Plato brings up this very issue and he starts talking about how seductive and how amazing it is that once people realize that there is a question about the relationship between the one and the many, that they just begin to just explode in philosophy because they wrestle with this problem and, and it mesmerizes them because you're talking about cups and coffee and the table in front of you. And, yep. and how do we, you know, what is the reality of these different things that we are separating out in our mind as individual, as many, and yet, are they all just simply one? And when we in our minds distinguish one cup from two cups or three cups, is there any universal standard that justifies us in doing that? Or is it simply that's a functioning of our mind struggling to come to terms with reality? And I don't have the answer to that. Interesting. But well, I think, <laughs> go ahead. To try to draw us out of this little nest of weeds we're in here. And Martin almost stated this exactly before. This is a quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, he says, in so far as the propositions of mathematics refer to reality, they are uncertain. In so far as they are certain, they do not apply to reality. Oh, that's a great quote. Hmm. Yeah, I thought just just to just to briefly bring us back to, to Epicurus's position here in section 30 is that I think that he doesn't say it explicitly, but it's implied that he says these he thinks are simply perceived just as the fact that and I, I'm going to add one more here. He says fire is hot, snow is white, honey sweet and pleasure good. <laughs> and then one plus one is two <laughs> there. Yeah, except for the fact. Exactly. Yes, because honey <laughs> Honey and sh and sugar and snow and things like that exist in reality. We can touch them and hold them in our hands and oh, and, and so that experience does not actually exist. Then I am saying that, that the word I am saying that I am not sure whether pleasure exists or whether or whether the 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 combination of letters P L E A S U R E is a concept a word uh, that we assign to this feeling and that's our one and many question is it appropriate to assign the single word pleasure or voluptas or or hedone or however we want to call it is it appropriate to assign that word to the many experiences in life between dancing and sex and food and so forth 
is that appropriate to do that? I think it's something that has to be wrestled with. Okay. Um, okay. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that. One. <laughs> okay. Okay. And because in fact, as, as, as we, as we close on this 31, Cicero says, Others, again, with whom I agree, finding that many arguments are alleged by philosophers to prove that pleasure is not to be reckoned, not only among the highest goods, but among things good at all. You know, so so you have all these differences of opinion and these differences of arguments that are out there. And I think Epicurus, part of what he's doing is saying, you've got to cut through this maze. You can't live your whole life in confusion about whether pleasure is good or not. You've got to come to some conclusion in your mind and have confidence in your conclusion as to what the the telos is. And Epicurus's answer is, look to the babies before they are perverted by these dastardly philosophers out there. Look to them and that's where nature is speaking in its most uncorrupted and unperverted form. And that's where you conclude that hedone or voluptas or pleasure is the goal. And it's not all these words that we're throwing out there. But Cicero says that he agrees with those who think you have to throw those words out there and that you have to uh, you have to construct these elaborate reasoned arguments, right. which may be exactly what we are doing in doing this podcast. We may be following that primrose path of that leads to disaster by thinking that we're going to define all these words in a, in a way that makes sense to us. It may be that in the end, the whole process of definition and logical reasoning is what Epicurus is saying you cannot rely on. Do you agree with that or disagree with that, Don? Mm. <laughs> is he saying that is he saying that your senses ultimately trump all the logic in the world? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua, Martin. Yeah, the thing is, if it if it's a question about something what the senses are competent about, then uh, they they are superior to whatever different uh, the logic uh, may may produce to. But in in typical cases where we have a discrepancy like like this, the the logic has been applied wrongly. So that means it's not correct log, log, logic. It's something like dialectical nonsense or something which right. produces discrepancy. Joshua, silence is not yeah, consent. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know, I know. That, that dreaded dead air. Uh. <laughs> no, no, I can edit I can edit out the dread air. I'm just letting you know that I'm going to edit out how Cat, much yeah, time Cat, you need. Cassius, Cassius can manipulate reality. <laughs> <laughs> but the next voice you hear will be that of Joshua, giving his answer yeah, to the ultimate yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think... When you when you cut through logic, when you cut through language and dialectic, and when you cut through eloquence and and purple prose, when you cut through you know church and state and all this stuff, you're going to get down to on some on some very deep level. There's a feeling, right? And that feeling is pleasure. And I think it's just self evidently the good. Well, well that's, that's my, my I don't, I don't like his <laughs> position. Wait a minute. Let's. I I find unacceptable the word self-evident. Tell me what you mean okay. when you say it is self-evident. I, I, yeah, I mean it doesn't have to be supported by. Uh, it. Well, let me let me use the lines. The problem before us then what is the climax and standard of things good? And this, in the opinion of all philosophers, must needs be such that we are bound to test all things by it, but the standard itself by nothing. That gets close to the idea of what I mean by self-evident, but it's the it's looking at the babies, you know, looking at the uh, little lambs. Well, when you say you use the word look, are you saying that the standard is sensation? <laughs> 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 I'm serious. I'm deadly. I'm absolutely deadly serious when I say that. We have I, to I know, pin this down. We yeah, must yeah. pin this down. We we cannot be in this limbo that Don would currently leave us in if we did not <laughs> pursue this further. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the person to take you out of the limbo right here because I don't have a I don't think I have an answer that's going to satisfy you on that question. Well, the, it's, it's related to the question about whether pleasure and pain are senses. It be, but but he's clearly t- talking mm, yeah, about they're not senses. senses. They're not senses. Pleasure and pain are not senses. Okay. Well, then why does he say, um, yeah, are they feelings though? And is feeling a sense? 
because he's clearly part of his reasoning is in this line 30. Moreover, seeing that if you deprive a man of his senses, there's nothing left to him. It's inevitable that nature herself should be the arbiter of what is in accord with or opposed to nature. Now, that sentence is not maybe as clear as, as we might think it is, and it probably bears a lot of discussion. But he's clearly talking about sensation. And of course, in principle doctrine, too, that you right. know, death is nothing to us because when, when we're dead, we have no senses. Right. So there's some relationship between senses and pleasure. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, sensation and senses. And I mean, that's the only way you can experience pleasure. I mean, it's the only way you can experience pain. Yeah. When, uh, when we expect, if we expand it to also inner sensations. Right. Right. You mean emotions and, and thoughts that are pleasurable. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. You know? so, so that right. means if, if I evoke memories of the past, it can cause me both pleasure and pain. And Don, this is your department. This is the this is why they use he uses the word pathé, right? It's it's effect or things right. that affect what you us. experience. Yeah, yeah, things that happen to you. Yeah, pleasure and pain are pathé, right? Pleasure and pain are, and of course, there's that other word, passions, that's out there that I think. And that has, such, that has such yeah, that's such a such a lot of baggage to it. Yeah. Okay, well, we need to come to a conclusion for today. We'll, 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 <laughs> and, and by conclusion, you mean in the widest possible sense. <laughs> exactly, because we're not deciding anything. And in fact, I think that's why we're attacking this text, and that's why we'll, what we'll be doing throughout the rest of this text is because we'll turn to the individual examples of things that people say are good, right. and we're going to be discussing, and of course the word is virtue there, but we're going to be discussing, well, are they good in themselves? Or are they good because they lead to pleasure? So we'll have plenty of opportunity to come back to this question, but at least today we have introduced the topic, and we we'll waiting for Don's further elaboration next week as well, but the issue it, it is... It needs no elaboration. It's so <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. That That is not a joke. That is not no, a joke. no. No, hmm. people may people may think it's a joke and we're laughing about it and I'm laughing about it. But it but ultimately, I do think that's where it comes back to. And of course, you've got the other position that Cicero is advocating that in addition to observing it, you can also bolster your conclusion using logic. And I'm not rejecting that as a valid position, because I think that's what we do see Epicurus doing. I mean, he's out there writing all these books with all these logical arguments that, that support his conclusions. So Epicurus is not an enemy of reason, and he's not an enemy of explaining things. Right. But he is telling I think, you, Yeah, yeah. I think you, there's a really good distinction, I think, too, between, between you know, reason and explaining things and the formal logic stuff that we've been talking about on the forum and that sort of thing. So, there, so there's a, I think there's a a demarcation between those two things because I think because I think the word logic gets used in a in a general common sense sort of way but it also gets used in a very formal academic way too so I think you have to distinguish between those two different things suppose that I, I don't even know if I should introduce another thought experiment into this <laughs> conversation but so we're going to call time soon regardless anyway go ahead yeah 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 this is kind of my final Suppo okay suppose that that I was just standing there right and somebody asks me the question how do you know that pleasure is the highest good and i just like lift my left arm and and gesture to a pig rolling around in the muck have i answered the question have i i, ha I haven't used logic i haven't i haven't tried to that's, prove anything uh but have i answered the question that's a very that's a very uh buddhist sort of uh <laughs> action too i think it didn't didn't he didn't the buddha literally have some sort of thing where somebody asked him a question and he was either silent or pointed to a flower or something like that 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 is zen buddhism to the core right there so. i i don't think that does answer the question frankly i'll just go ahead and be on record there by saying that that right. i think a, a i think a fair reading of the question presumes a lot of facts that have to be explained and you've you've set out your question as being highest good, and I, I'm still struggling with the one and the many of that in terms of whether there are many goods or is there a single highest good in reality? Because I, at the end of the podcast, I'm going to I'm going to probably I don't know if it's the same position I had before or not, but I have a feeling. I have a feeling that's a funny way of saying it. But I have a feeling that the expression highest good is a purely conceptual construct of the mind and that nature just simply calls us to pleasure 
through the feelings and the sensations, but to equate what nature calls us to as the, quote, highest good, unquote, is a human way of looking at it that has limitations that are built in, that are strong. Well, we are very, only human. We are only human. Yes. All right. Well, this is a good time to call time for today. Uh, any concluding thoughts of today, Martin? No, I'm fine. <laughs> You're fine. You should not be <laughs> fine. You should be struggling with these core issues and just <laughs> anxious to get back to it next week. I'm sure you are. So I know I am. But OK, Joshua. Well, I'll just say this as I as I go through my week in anticipation of uh, next Sunday, uh, the question I'll be trying to sit with is how do we avoid the traps of language when language is the medium by which we're discussing mm-hmm. the traps? <laughs> right. Right. Which is, I think, the main problem. But that's those are my closing thoughts. Don? I, I would agree with Joshua. I'm going to try and go back and reread Sedley's translation of On Nature, book 26, I believe it is, and see what uh, Epicurus has to say about language. So that would be interesting. But uh, you, you've definitely given, given me food for thought, but I'm not sure if I've changed my position yet. But I am certainly open to the debate. I think this is going to be a fun time in the arena. Exactly. And I'm not sure that anybody's nobody's trying to win the debate. We're all trying to struggle towards the truth and go. figure out what the truth is. And even whether we can whether we can define it or whether we just simply have to point to those <laughs> kittens and puppies and say, I'm going to do what they're doing. And when Cicero comes back to us and says that that's the life of a cow, we're going to say moo. <laughs> and we're going to say <laughs> we're not going to be intimidated by the idea right. that logic in the end can trump the way nature leads us. Yeah, and that's that's and that's my take on those last two um, arguments about the the uh, the later Epicureans. I think that they were I think that they were um, intimidated by the other schools and felt they had to come up with something more. So. And that's where I'll close. That's why we're doing this. I think that's exactly yeah. right, Don. I think that that's the decline and fall of the Epicurean school is that these later Epicureans right. essentially abandoned the field to the Stoics. They decided that you've got to have these elaborate logical arguments to defend yourself. They gave up their confidence in the original core positions of Epicurus and was certainly given large assists by Christianity and Judaism right. and the different religions that didn't like it. But yeah. in the end, they lost their confidence in themselves by, right. by falling away from this basic position. There you go. Good place to end. <laughs> Good place to end. Okay, thanks again. We'll do it again next week. So talk with you then. All right. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, bye-bye. Sir.